Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. Uh, my name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Today we're gonna talk about the thesis, go, get deeper into it, and talk a little bit about um, maybe other people's opinions, my opinion, and then the data. The data that uh, most people, I don't know, either don't know, have forgotten, or maybe they just don't look at it. I don't know. And then there's other data that people look at and they misconstrue what the data actually is saying. Um, so for instance, I'll take one of the, the pieces of data. Um, I think one of the guys had posted on Twitter. He said that there's 9 million homes in inventory from of, of new homes. Problem is, and there's multiple ways to look at this, is that's 9 million homes in the total pipeline. That is things that are just started. That's things that have concrete poured. That's things where they're starting to put up the house. Uh, there's very, very low, if no inventory of new homes that are finished, completed, and ready to sell. The active inventory of homes is at all time lows. Now this inventory, when it reverses and goes back up, and I will show you that in some data here that, that I have, um, basically what, let me step back real quick. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find truths. I'm trying to find the truth of what drives markets. Because if I know what drives markets, I know what to look at, I know what the leading indicators are, and then I know how to invest in position. That is literally what, what everyone is, or at least what I am trying to seek in the markets is what drives what? What are the leading indicators? What are the... Um, things that I can use to make money in the markets. And there are a lot of people that, I mean, once you start diving into this, uh, you're going to expose a bunch of people who don't know what the heck they're talking about. And they're all over the place. And I'm not saying that I necessarily know, but I know that they don't know. Half the stuff that comes out of their mouth, I'm just like, I don't think so. I do not think so. And I'm just going to put together some, some evidence of why I think those people are wrong. And I'm not gonna call out certain people, but there's a whole bunch. We're surrounded by them, they're everywhere. And I'm gonna bring up some key points in this clip that may challenge the thought process of what most people think. May, may Am I gonna be wrong? I don't know, we'll find out. But it's gonna challenge things. And I'm also going to draw some conclusions or draw some parallels or however you wanna say it. Um, to maybe perhaps the situation that we're in today. So I've got a clip behind me. I, I watched this clip from a long time ago. Uh, this person, Mr. Alan Kendall, uh, awesome guy, awesome guy. You guys can go watch his clips if you want. Uh, he says, should I buy real estate in 2022? And he changes this, da this date here uh, every single year. He, he changes the way this is, but he posted this August 2nd of 2011. Uh, what he shows is the real estate cycle over time, and he shows the 2006 peak uh, that we would roughly go down from 2012 to 2016, the foreclosures run out, and then we have a large, big move after 2016, 2017, 2018. It all depends on when the foreclosures run out, but this is just a general guideline for what is coming. He's got the peak in 2027, and he has a massive run-up of real estate between uh, the late 2010s and all the way till mid to late 2020s. The exact dates don't get too, too bent on the exact dates. It's the overall cycle and the overall moves that happen. Now, he, he posted this in 2011 and described it perfectly of what was going to happen in the real estate market. It is the real estate cycle. It is something that I grabbed onto and did further research into and developed part of my thesis on. And it's from this particular clip. Now, those people who are looking at the the medical event that happened in 2019, 2020, that did not drive this. If he knew this was coming before in 2011, nothing in 2019 or 2020 was going to cause the move in real estate. It could maybe amplify it a little bit. The move was already in place. The trend was already intact. I can show that with data. So the people who said that COVID caused this crisis are false. They don't know what they're talking about. They are 
not into the real estate cycle. They do not study this. And people who think that interest rates will necessarily cure this, I'm not so sure. This place happened in these time frames in rising interest rate environments. The 1970s had a massive increase in interest rates. And that environment did not stop the inflation from coming. Higher rates didn't kill inflation. The demographics did. And we'll take a look at that. What I'm trying to do with everything is to find the truth, to find who knows what markets are necessarily doing. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting kind of sick and tired of listening to people who are drawing conclusions which are just utterly false. I don't think they have really looked at the data. I don't know if they understand the markets as well as what they think they do. Because if, if this person can go back from 2011 and call the market with, this, with such accuracy, based off the real estate cycle, why can't they? How come they don't know about this? Well, anyway, looking at this, this is the data. So this, what, what he describes, and I'll just go through it real quick. Um, this would come down, we would be in a recovery phase for a while. That's 2012 to 2016, maybe a little bit further in the future, depending on the foreclosures. Remember, he did this in 2011. You buy a house down here, the inventory dries up, and then you get into a squeeze scenario on this side. That's where the new housing starts kick in. We go into an expansionary phase. That expansionary phase would probably last till roughly 2027. Then it would peter out. We build too many homes and we'd go into another cycle. Uh, down cycle, recession. Now, looking at the data, what, what, this, what he proposed here, what he would see and what he proposed is that we would see a tightening of inventory. We'd see new housing starts kick up all at the same time around 2020, 2021, 2022, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, and then we'd get into some over, overbuilt scenario. And he, al we, he also predicted, or maybe not predicted, but, but said that uh, we would be in an increasing interest rate environment. I agree with that too. He said this in 2011, 2011, that all this was coming and it's playing out just like we thought. And if you look at the data, this is the data that I grabbed. Um, this is someone from work uh, put this together. Uh, this is the existing home uh, inventory levels, and it continues to decline. It is cyclical if you look at this chart. You don't need to be a real estate expert to know that this is cyclical. All you have to do is know a little bit of knowledge of how to read data. Beginning of every year, you can see a build in inventory every single year. It is cyclical. And, in, and the, the trend and overall highs and lows are getting lower and lower as we basically feed into this demographic. The demographic is the millennials. The demographic is this that's coming. And the baby boomers, you have to add 30 years to these. So 1970 to 1980, we had a dip in the demographics in that middle of the 1970s. This dip shows up in all of your charts, the gold chart. Uh, we had a recession in this uh, area, and that's the rate of change of the population. It's not the volume or area under the curve. What you want to know is you need an influx of people, a large, we'll call it wall of demographic or people that come into home buying years that throws everything into a shortage. The greater rate of change, the greater rate of shortage in the markets. And this was that pullback. Interest rates didn't kill this deflationary pullback. It was the demographic. It was in the DNA of the market through the demographics. Now, we also had this rate of change. It was a smaller one, and it wasn't that huge of an alignment. Uh, so we had a little baby, um, a, a baby commodity boom based off of liquidity into the system from the housing market in 2000s. That's 30 years is 2000 up to 2005, six, seven, eight. What's coming is this guy. It's a much larger rate of change and it's a larger demographic coming into home buying years, which could be similar to 1970 to 1975, something on the lines of that. But we also have an alignment that has uh, uh, an energy crisis at the beginning of it, just like the 1970s. The 1970s was an energy crisis in the United States. It was peak oil for 
the regular fields in 1970. Now it's peak oil worldwide. And we have this liquidity coming into the system and we have a shortage in energy. This is going to be a mega bull in commodities on steroids. And the reason is we've got this, this demographic that's coming. It's a good rate of change. It's liquidity into the system. And when you look at the housing market, you listen to all these people. Everybody thinks that we're in this massive bubble. This is what a bubble looks like. It doesn't look like this. It looks like this. And there's a couple of things that I want you to know about this chart that I think are very important. Um, one is the overall uh, levels that the inventory is at. 3.6 million is up here. We are at 1 million. So we need uh, 3.6, or I'm sorry, 2.6 million, or let's just say uh, we need about 3 million to get back up to this level where the tip of the bubble was. About 3, about 3 million homes. And if you look back at 2000, that entire boom happened with inventories going up. These inventories were going upward. They were not positioned downward. And what we have is we have something where a trend is in place and a larger demographics coming into home buying years, and we are eating through our inventories faster and faster and faster. Uh, and what we can draw from this conclusion is that we've never been one, we've never been inventories this low, um, especially to how many buyers we have. Because remember, we've got a lot more people, the volume is a lot higher, we have a lot less in inventory than any time in history. Two, what I want you to get from this is that even if inventories go up, home prices will still continue to go up. It just may be at a slower rate of change. They were they are still going higher. But we have not seen this downtrend broken yet. I'm not trying to predict the future. I just think it's irresponsible for people to say that we are in a bubble and we've never been at all-time low inventory levels like we are today. That is irresponsible. You have to wait for the data to come out and say, okay, this is in fact changing. Now, those are the, some main things. One, we're in a downtrend. It hasn't broken yet. We are at all-time low levels. And the market will still go up with inventory going up. That's what I want you to walk away from. Next, if you look at the housing starts, a bubble is when the housing starts go below the long-term average. And it's going down, and that's when the bubble breaks, is when it goes below it. A boom is when you come above it and you stay elevated above the average. That is an expansionary phase of real estate. Recessions almost always come. Deflationary recessions, when you go below the average and you crash below the average and you crash you get these dark recession lines it's happened many times in history this is the leveraging up this is the deleveraging as it goes below the average downward and you have foreclosures you have destruction of credit we had this recession here but it was mainly contained to the stocks the nasdaq.com bubble i propose that something like this is going to come again and it's probably going to be pretty bad but as long as this is up, the liquidity is still coming into the system. It's still there. It just doesn't go poof and you, and you rock it lower unless you shut down the economy like we did in 2020, where they shut it down. That was man-made. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that they're going to do that again. I don't know. But we are up above in an expansionary phase of real estate. <laughs> that has not changed. And it takes time for it to change. The peak here was in 2006, and it took all the way down to 2007, 2008 to get below it. It took two years of building inventory to get down there. Now I'm going to skip past the, the home prices, but we've got U.S. foreclosure starts. And if you notice, the foreclosures were ramping up in 05 the entire time, and we were still somewhat in a boom in 05. But this is where things got crazy, is your foreclosures really started to ramp up. In order for this to ramp up, you have to be underwater. You can't sell your house. You get stuck in the house. You're, that is what a bubble looks like. You get foreclosures coming on up. Then you get the break of it. But these are bad loans in the system. I don't think we have these bad loans necessarily out there that were created three, four, five years ago because it takes time for them to get through the system. It takes time for them to go bust, and it, it just takes time. This is where we are now. We are very low on our foreclosure starts in 2022 of quarter one. 
nowhere near anything like it was last bubble market. Now, I know a lot of people are speculating on, well, there's going to be unemployment. And people are going to lose their jobs. There's going to be more foreclosures. Well, not if there's a bunch of equity in the house. They could just sell their house if they needed to. Also, unemployment went up during the 1970s, the same time that we had one of the largest real estate booms. So I wouldn't use and put too much, uh, I wouldn't put too much faith in the unemployment argument because it doesn't hold water when you look back at history. It's only supply and demand. It's the available buyers given how much inventory you have. That's really what determines it. It's a supply demand balance. And then looking at uh, days on the market, the days on the market are continuing to get tighter and tighter. Now, will this turn around with the higher interest rates and the rate of change of interest rates has been great? I don't know. We'll find out. And when we look at the days of 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 the days on the market versus median sales price, you can see where it is now and where it was back uh, at that time. And we didn't have a bubble necessarily, and even in 06. We had a bubble when we got back, and I would say 07 is more of an indication. 07, like above 60 days and moving on higher in that trend is where I would say, okay, we have problems. Now, down here, we are way low. We are still squeezing up. Now, will this turn around? I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out. I'm, I'm, but I just think it's really premature to be thinking that, uh, that we're just going to go straight to a bubble. Maybe we will. Maybe we will. But we, the data doesn't show it yet. Looking at the value of homeowner equity and real estate in the United States from 1960 to 2020 in trillions of U.S. dollars, uh, we had a large decline in 05, and then it started declining in 06, 07, 08. This decline will cause a crash because those loans out there are now underwater, which means you own more on the loan than you do have equity in the house. So they just defaulted, they foreclosed. So we would see a an increase of foreclosures from 06, 07, 08 and onward. And what do we see? 06, 07, 08 and onward, we had a massive increase in foreclosures as these people were underwater. They couldn't sell their house. They owed more on it than what they had. And now we are continuing to go up. The equity continues to go up. And I don't see anything indicating that we are going down yet at least in homeowner equity because the prices of the homes are continuing to go higher at this time so there's no hard evidence or facts in here that i can see that shows us that we are in bubble territory as of right now and i don't believe that covid was the cause of this market move not if people understood that the cycle was in place and, and we were going to have a large increase in the price of homes after 2016-17. That's when things start to ramp. So then you want to ask yourself the question, and here's the question I pose. If we are in a shortage of homes, what does that look like? Well, first, we would see home prices skyrocketing. Check. We would see inventories get drawn down to very low levels. If we have a very large imbalance, our inventories would be at all-time lows. Check. Then we would see rent prices go ballistic. Check. What am I missing here? And why is this a bubble? Now, wouldn't you think that people who are more well-off would start buying more homes and renting them out if the rent rental prices were higher than it is to buy the house uh, and have mortgage payments? Yeah, probably. Is that what people are doing? Probably to some extent, yes. Because as, as, as rent prices continue to go higher, people are going to have to be forced to make decisions if they want to buy or rent. And if there's a smaller pool of homes in the, in the, in the pool of homes, and there just isn't enough to go around, that means prices are going to skyrocket. And we're going to build a lot of new homes. Now, some people are talking about 9 million homes in the pipeline of, of the housing market. People are looking at that, at that saying, oh my goodness, there are that many homes in the pipeline. Now, there's two ways to look at that. When people think that interest rates are going up and there's all these homes in the pipeline, and remember, these are not built yet, a lot of them. 
they say, oh my goodness, this is a bubble. But here's my question back to everyone else. If we had the largest shortage of homes, the largest imbalance in the demographics that we've ever seen with a, with a housing shortage coming into it, how many homes should be in the pipeline then? And if 9 million homes are in the pipeline and they get completed and they get loans against it, well, wouldn't that be the largest inflationary boom that we would ever see? The homes in the pipeline aren't a result of a bubble. The homes in the pipeline are a result of the demographics and the shortage that we have today. So it's the way that you're viewing it, it's the, the paradigm that you're looking at. And I'll put this clip in the link below if you guys want, uh, if you want to view it. And uh, if you want to get his opinion, uh, we're not in a bubble, if you want to know. But that is what we would see if we have the largest shortage of homes. Now, will interest rates have an impact on the housing prices? We'll find out. Just watch inventories. If inventories start to go up, I bet you the rate of change will slow down. Now, what if they don't slow down? What if the interest rates won't stop inflation? What if they're not high enough yet? And maybe they can't get to a level where they would actually slow it down and stop it. Maybe it's 8.5% on mortgage rates. Maybe, maybe that's what. Maybe they bought all of these mortgage-backed securities to have absolute control over all of these markets. Maybe they are manipulating absolutely everything. Can rates get high enough to slow down the housing market versus the stock market and bond market getting absolutely destroyed? I don't know. Those are questions that I think are good questions that, that no one's going to know the answer. Uh, if they raise rates high enough to kill the, the real estate market, will it kill the stock market and bond market in its entirety before the real estate market. So I don't know. I don't know which one's more robust. Can't, I, I, I would think so. I would think that the real estate market is more robust than the overall stock market. So I would be careful. I'd be careful on drawing conclusions, especially without the data. Because all these people who are calling for a housing bubble, I think are premature. Now, maybe we have one. I'm not saying that it's not impossible to have one. I just think it's very premature to be calling for one. And everything for a large real estate boom is intact, and it so the evidence supports that we are coming with the we'll call it the largest imbalance of homes, and which would lead to the largest home building boom that we would that we would see in a very long time. So we we should have a lot of new homes in the pipeline, which is inflationary. So it depends how you look at this, and we'll see if those homes sell. That's what you have to do. The markets aren't, they don't go day to day. And, and it's kind of weird seeing all these people run around screaming, crash, 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 crash. It's like, guys, I don't see it in the data. At least not yet. And maybe they're right. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll be right. We'll find out. But uh, I'm positioned for this to happen. Why? Because that's what the data tells me to do. I should be positioned long. For an inflationary environment in commodities, and all of the commodity signals are still good. All of the technical charts are still good in the majority of the commodities that I watch. I've got full alignment there. These other guys, they don't. They don't have alignment. They don't have. They're, they're trying to make predictions against the trend. And I'll just tell you this when you try going against the trend, you usually get flattened. <laughs> you go until the trend changes. The trend is changing in technology stocks. The trend is changing in bonds. That's all evidence that those markets believe me and not them. That's what it's telling me. Now, could this change in the short term? This is where it gets really difficult. Things can cycle in the short term, up and down, and people can get scared and emotions and whatnot. So the question is is the pullback in some of these short term? Or is it an actual change? We'll have to figure that out. Uh, but that's something you want to monitor. And I, I'm talking about the 10-year yield. I'm talking about these things that may be pulling back in the short term, bouncing off a resistance line. I still think the trend's in place. That's my uh, take on it. Other people, 
they think that's going to be, you know, that this is the top and they'll scream the top every time it turns. And it's difficult in the stock market because it's it's got shorter cycles. The real estate's a, rip, a big long cycle. So I think the real estate market's still intact and I think it's very hard to knock this real estate market off of its track. Uh, if it is driven by supply, demand, and balances, and we have as large of balances as we think, I think that that trend will stay intact. And I don't think the the interest rates can slow it down, but I don't know if it can stop that trend. It's all demographic and supply demand driven. Now, if I was right, if it's if it's a demographic that's larger, we should see all of this happen across the United States, the whole thing. It's not one city versus two cities and people moving from one state to another state. It's across the entire board. So it doesn't make me think that it's because people are are working from home and that certain regions are getting, you know, it, there is some of that going on, yes, but we are seeing an overall market everywhere, uh, for the most part, going up in the United States. And there are obviously regions that are hotter than others. I understand that. But it's, it's, it is across the nation, for the most part, uh, in the more desirable cities. Now, there's some, I'm sure there's some cities that people don't want to live in at all, and maybe they don't get anybody. But um, it's highly dependent on where jobs are at. And it's highly dependent on where people want to live. I understand that. So I just wanted to talk about this. I wanted to give my opinion out there because I see a lot of people who are very negative on the real estate market. I will be negative on, I will be positive until the trend changes. The trend hasn't changed yet. And everyone else who's trying to pick these tops, good luck with them. It's very hard to do that. I wait until the data tells me to, then it usually waits another year or two, and then it'll fall. Uh, the thing is, all of my indicators, Every single one, not a single one has turned negative. That's home prices, um, days on the market, inventory, interest rates are not high enough yet. They're not above the rate of inflation. And you can go on and on. There's a couple more that you can that you can look at. Prices start to level off and start to decline. There's a bunch of things that you look at. None of them are negative. Foreclosures going to critical levels in an increasing fashion. They're all super low. So they're all positive at this time. So I don't know what the, the bubble, the, the, the bubble people are talking about. And uh, right now I'm staying course. That's it's as simple as that. Uh, if you guys like the content, give me a thumbs up, uh, subscribe to the channel. If you haven't subscribed to the website, find a membership website to figure out how to play this uh, commodity boom that's coming that we're in the process of. Uh, it's not coming. It is here. And it's in the middle of it now. All right, guys, uh, we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.